just before we begin question time, which will be chaired by Brian here, I want to tell you that today is Brian's birthday. And we want to <laughs> He claims to be 21, but I think he's exaggerating his age. We have a card here, and I can tell you, in fact, but you have to work it out for yourself. I can tell you the age. It's his Beatle birthday. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Many years from now, but with him, it's right there. So, <laughs> here we are. <laughs> of English. Uh, and then we have Jane Setter, lecturer in phonetics at the University of Reading, <coughs> followed by Bev Collins, ex-lecturer from the University of Leiden, and then <coughs> Phil Harrison, freelance rhythm guitar, new <laughs> rhythm guitar. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <coughs> someone else. Jeff. Tell me about yourself. What can we say about you? Uh, One of our best former students. Oh, yes. Ex student. <laughs> okay, I've divided the questions into several categories, and I thought we'd start with some general ones. Um, Thanks very much for sending the questions in. You saved me the trouble of inventing them. So, uh, the first question is about terms of reference. Which terms of reference do the panel prefer and why? RP, SSB, for example, we find in, sometimes in the uh, Journal of the International Phonetic Association, SSB being some standard British. Uh, BBC English. Would anybody like to start? Well, well I don't mind, yes, yes. Uh, but I hate them all, you see. I, I, I've got my own pet term. Uh, I, like, I don't like RP because receive is terribly old fashioned and sounds snobbish. Right? And anyway, to put things the wrong way around, they're uh, an abbreviation. I like it to be short, that's a good thing about it. But, uh, the important thing about the kind of English that most of us teach here is that it's neutral geographically within Britain, right? Uh, and not that it's just received, that it's accepted, admired, prestigious, and so on. Uh, you can argue about the prestige, but you can't argue about whether, if you hear somebody say a word a certain way, whether he sounds positively not to be from one particular part of Britain, right? Uh, certainly England. So I don't like our people. I gave it up 40 years ago. <laughs> 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 I used to use it like everybody else, and I, I mean, I don't often want, so I 
produced by Unter, <laughs> which is my private possession, though we have a positive unit to start with. I call it general British. But I also hate SSBE, because that means Southern Standard British English. Now, it's not Southern. It's far more general. Uh, you can have people like the Prince of Wales, who spent most of his youth in Scotland, and he doesn't, he doesn't have a, a Scottish accent. You know? You'll find up and down the country various people who have this sort of neutral accent geographically, and so uh, uh, I don't like Southern Standard British. I also don't like Standard, because if you say one person speaks his Standard accent, what are the others doing? And I'm non-standard. Am I self-standard? If, if I'm not speaking standard, I don't like that. Uh, it casts the wrong aspersions. So all these terms are very clumsy and awful, I think, except because my own term, general <laughs> Richard, is incredible. <laughs> <laughs> we have strong feelings on that. I think that's enough on that topic. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to say something, so I'll add to Jack. I, I use the term NRP, which stands for non-regional pronunciation, which I think puts in three letters what Jack has uh, been uh, saying. And I think the important thing is to realize, you know, that the lack of any true regional association, but it's all right, we all know it started off in the, in the, in the southeast. But uh, I think that's the crucial thing uh, to say about it, rather than the fact that it's very prestigious, it's very beautiful, it's very melodious, so many things. The non-regionality of it is the thing which makes it uh, a suitable uh, model, in my view. Uh, for uh, non-natives. I think we'll move on to another question. I'd like to put this one to Jane. Is it possible to acquire a native-like English accent without having lived in an English-speaking country? If you're a non-native speaker. Okay. Um, well, as the token female on this panel, <laughs> um, I feel that I'm uniquely placed to answer this question. <laughs> Not really. Um, I have known people who have managed to do this. You have to be really directed to be able to do this anyway, whether you're in an English-speaking environment or not. You have to be able to listen very, very carefully to sound patterns. You have to be able to monitor what you're doing, and you have to be able to adapt when you hear different different patterns to, to the ones that you're producing. I don't think it's impossible. Um, I would probably say that it's rare, um, but I have known people when I lived in Japan, for example, who managed to teach themselves um, English pronunciation from the songs of Elvis Presley um, or from the Beatles or similar. So um, it is something that I've known to happen, but in my um, experience, it's relatively rare. Um, but then I think another question is, why should you want to have a particular accent anyway? So it's your choice, of course, if you want to sound like a, um, a British or American speaker of one kind or another, or somebody from somewhere else. Um, but my, my key thing is that people should be understood by the majority of other speakers in English. So um, I don't think it's out of the question that you can do this, but I think it's rare. And uh, the focus should be on being understood by most people, in my opinion. OK, thank you, Jane. Somebody on the course asked, <coughs> In my homeland, some accents sound quainter than others. Is this also true of the UK? I suppose it's true of uh, any country, but uh, what does the panel have to say about this? It all depends on your starting point. What is quaint to one person may be everyday and normal to somebody else. So you can't give a general answer, I think, to this question. Yes, accents, for example, that come from remote rural areas may strike people who live in cities as being quaint, but for the people who live in the village, they are not. Thank you. Another student said, the cardinal vowels were introduced to us and we were told that they are the vowels of no existing language. Yeah. Is this in fact true? Well, I suppose it may <coughs> coincidentally, they may coincide with the vowels of uh, particular languages, or some of them may happen to coincide, but the uh, the brief answer is yes, it is, it is true, they don't belong to any language. Right. Okay, I'll move on so we can get through as many questions as possible. Yeah, I've got quite a lot. Um, 
Somebody else asks, is there a turning point when you can no longer acquire new cells? Referring to language acquisition, uh, is there a particular age beyond which it becomes impossible to acquire new cells? Is that just completely erroneous film? Yeah, because, yeah. Um, I don't think it's impossible, it's just that you have to follow a different psychological routine. Um, when we are first language acquirers, we uh, unconsciously derive the vocabulary of sounds that we need, that we're going to need for our native language. When we are second language learners, we have to follow um, uh, an entirely different um, route through our through our through our perceptions and, and through our through our classifications. Much more conscious thing to do. So you can't, I don't think you can do the same thing that you can do when you're an infant. But I, I don't, it doesn't mean it's impossible to acquire sounds. I mean, people will say that they, they can't, you know, British speakers will say that they, they just can't do h. Well, of course they can do h. And of course your, your vocal equipment can do anything anybody else's vocal equipment can do. But it's the way the mind works that's different when you're when you past a certain age, not the way your vocal equipment works. Thank you. The last of the general questions is what changes are likely to take place in RP over the next 50 years? Extinction. <laughs> 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 Somebody else asked, are we, will we all be speaking Estuary in English? <laughs> Well, there's the problem of defining what is meant by estuary English, because although journalists and many other people use this term, it's not well defined phonetically, uh, nor sociolinguistically, because the claim that there's a great sort of splodge of the southeast of England that has adopted this new accent is just untrue once you look at the details on the ground. On the other hand, this is a useful way of summing up some of the main trends in the development of English pronunciation, and in this respect it's related to the previous question. And I think we can expect to see, for example, plot and stop for T uh, extending to a wider range of phonetic environments and being less stigmatized. We can see probably various changes in vowels and diphthongs similarly spreading. We may see the loss of dental fricatives or the gradual loss at least of some of them. But nobody can predict the future. We can't either. <laughs> okay, the next batch of questions concerns dictionaries and learning. Um, somebody asked which is the best dictionary, <laughs> LPD, EPD, or OPD? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's too invidious, really, to ask us to comment. Yeah. Not really a fair question. Consumers. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. I, I can tell you which one my hand goes to first. It's there. I can tell you which hand it goes to second. Be careful. It goes here to uh, the, uh, the EPD that Jane proposed. So that hand goes hardly ever, I'm afraid, to the uh, OPD. It hardly ever goes to the uh, Oxford Pronouncing Dictionary. So uh, that's my personal uh, use. These two dictionaries are literally on my shelf, and I look at them uh, all the time. But uh, I'm afraid I rather ignore the Oxford. Uh, well, I, Jimmy, oh, I've actually gone so far as to, in print, say what I thought of those three dictionaries. Mm -hmm. And I must admit, I came out thinking that overall, uh, particularly for phonetics, people interested in phonetics, the, the most enjoyable one to use is John's dictionary. But I did say that James was a strong rival. <laughs> and as for the uh, other dictionary, the Oxford one, it's very interesting, but it's a bit eccentric. It starts to redefine RP, for instance, in a way that nobody else uses it. So uh, that's not very helpful. The one good thing about this Oxford dictionary, though, which I say I don't really recommend, is that it's beautifully easy to read compared to the others, because John and Jane have got such complicated notations that I myself can't make up how to say the word sometimes when I read it. 
in some words, have got so many little little uh, letters and italic letters and other marks and so <laughs> What are they really recommending me to do? So what I say the problem is we haven't got the dictionary we need yet for students. We need a shorter dictionary that's simpler for most people. I should mention that Jack himself produced a concise pronouncing dictionary in 1972, which attempted to meet these uh, objections he's just raised. Uh, I thought he met them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, used, I used that dictionary for a couple of years with students, and uh, very successful. Now, yes, so the question relating to the LPD, LPD3, the new edition, one student said, was it worth making the changes we made, John, in the third edition concerning the extended use of the shortened fleece and crew spell. Okay, we're talking, about the, spell. we're talking about the prefixes spelled D-E-R-E-P-R-E -E -E and so on. Words like prepare, remember, denote, where I simplified what had previously been in the dictionary, which listed one after another, denote or denote, Perhaps denote, I don't know, uh, by using the happy vowel, so just writing denote, and then perhaps with the schwa alternative. This same space, which publishes love, so it means you can put more <coughs> words in the same number of pages, and uh, I think reflects the truth that just as it doesn't matter whether you have happy or happy, it doesn't matter whether you have remember or remember. So I think it's justified on theoretical grounds and also on practical grounds. Of course, any change upsets some people. But I think I see this as giving you sort of greater freedom. This is yet another environment in which the tricky distinction between beat and bit is irrelevant and unimportant. Okay, I think we'll change the focus slightly. Um, somebody else was concerned with the following. Can non-native pronunciation being a valid model for students. Anything else? What do you think about that? A valid model. <laughs> <A> valid model. <laughs> um, well, I suppose it depends on what, what we mean by model um, and which one you pick. But I, I, I'll say something that's maybe not a direct response to the question. I personally don't think there's anything wrong with uh, people acquiring a form of English that mixes uh, features from more than one accent of English. I don't think that's something that you need to do. Uh, a lot of speakers, a lot of the, I've had very uh, wonderful, advanced uh, uh, speakers of my groups this year, and um, it's very common to find people who have uh, British vowels, maybe you say the vowel, the British vowel of law, in court, and law, but are rhotic, that is to say they pronounce an R or wherever it occurs in the spelling, like in the rhotic accents of English, American, or Canadian, Scottish, Irish, etc. And this is fine, I don't think roticity is ever a problem. Um, perhaps if any of the other people on the panel are considering me, they should say so. But I, wouldn't, I, don't dis I, 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 I tell people that if they want to have a uh, general British accent, Jack, a general British accent, then uh, they can. Um, uh, work to suppress R when it isn't uh, in front of the vowel. But um, I don't uh, say that they should for, for intelligibility um, benefits. I think it's never a, an obstacle to intelligibility to have uh, roticity. Thank you. I don't think the inconsistency of, have, of speaking something which is rather like RP, standard Southern British English, but is rhotic, I don't think, I don't think the inconsistency causes anybody any problems. Can you say more if, if, there is a, a sort of almost trivial point here about what you want to do with your language. Um, if you have a nation using any language, we're talking about English here, that where the it's it's taught by non-natives to non-natives with all sorts of um, transfer errors from another language in the country, then after several uh, after several generations, you get to a point where you can get mutual non-intelligibility between some speakers of so-called English and some speakers of other Englishes. So that this is not what Jeff was talking about at all. This is, this is things like um, uh, some sort of Caribbean English, Indian English. I mean, I was in India a couple of years ago and I had a lot of difficulty understanding some of the people who were speaking English to me. They didn't have any problem with each other, 
but I had a problem with them because the English has is, 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 is gone somewhere else. So if you want to talk English to your own community that's using a type of English, then there's never a problem. There could be, if you're using a non-native uh, model, a problem for you globally, if you expect to be understood right around the world. Okay. There were several <coughs> teachers on the course who were concerned with how many hours should be de devoted to pronunciation if you're teaching English to students, um, English in general, grammar as well as pronunciation. What uh, proportion of that course of that course should be devoted to pronunciation? Any short answers to that, Jane? I, I think that's a silly question. You should fit in pronunciation whenever you can and do as much of it as you possibly can. So it's not a matter of the proportion or hours, it's a matter of teaching it along with everything else to do with the language that you're teaching. And you know, if you have a course which lasts 20 hours, then within that 20 hours you'll have some pronunciation and if you have a course which lasts for a year and is much longer, then you'll have not much more. It's a, it's a how long is a piece of string question. It's a bit like the what will happen to RP in 50 years. We, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. There's, not, there's not a sensible answer, but you know, my feelings on this. You do pronunciation along with everything else and you make it relevant and you, you, you make it clear what it's doing. Um, so it's not, not something that you can answer um, by saying you should spend a fifth or a half or 100% of the time. It's not, not that sort of thing. Okay. There's a question about centering diphthongs. Somebody said, what will be the fate of centering diphthongs if <laughs> air is uh, becoming a long one of them, just as or for many people has become a long monothon. I still use a slightly diphthongal variant in open syllables. I say more, um, but uh, the recommended pronunciation is, a, is with a monothon. Uh, is anything happening to ear? And uh, what can we say about uh, the centering diphthongs in general? What is likely to be their fate? Their fate is to become monothongs. And yes, there are plenty of people who say beer rather than beer. Uh, not only in Britain, but also, for example, in Australia. This seems to be the general direction of movement, that the centering diphthongs are simplified into a long monophones. Already, I feel a bit old-fashioned when I sit on a chair, because there are all these people who call it a chair. I think this will be easier for non-natives to uh, imitate, because a lot of people have a vowel similar to air, which they can just use, and that. Um, I used to find it uh, uh, rather hypocritical for me to say, well, you should say air. And I now no longer feel we have the imprimatur. <laughs> but we don't, uh, I no longer feel that I have to mention this as being the, uh, the uh, best, uh, as it were, pronunciation. I can say air with the best of them. <laughs> and it is perhaps worth pointing out to uh, teachers of Japanese students that it's not a door in any kind of English. It's a door in my English or a door in American English. That's what you should aim at. Right. Somebody else asked, when will no, our legalization become part of our English? Did I put my oar in here? Your oar? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm reminded of the remark made by the famous American writer Mark Twain, who said in the newspaper, the reports of my death have been exaggerated. Uh, people keep on saying that the ear air words set of diphthongs are disappearing. I don't think they are. There are plenty of signs of health in them. And the, the thing about them smoothing out is they've been smoothed out by many people constantly for over a hundred years. We've got plenty of 19th century examples of, of the word fairy being pronounced fairly not fairy. And if you say fairy, it's frightfully old fashioned. So, so don't worry about it. I've got another question related to change here uh, concerning L vocalization. Somebody asked when will L vocalization become part of our teaching model? I think, well, I think it already is part of my teaching model. I certainly encourage students to uh, vocalize their dark L's. Um, what about other people here? <coughs> Depends where they are, I'd say it depends on the context. So 
I, I would say that if you have it in a word like dog, for instance, as dog, I don't think any, I don't think anybody is going to complain uh, about that. I think if you have it after um, front uh, vowels, or if you say something like built, then I think this sounds uh, regionalized. So I think this sounds like London or the southeast. So I think it depends on the phonetic context in which it occurs. I'm, I'm very, very happy that uh, vocalized L is uh, more and more standard now, more and more general, more and more accepted. Because um, you use it. I'd be very no, I don't. I don't at all. I'm, you know, I'm from the north, northwest. I build. I don't have. Vote L vocalization really strikes my ear more strongly than it does. I think it strikes yeah. the ears of me and Phil. Yeah. Me and Phil <laughs> a lot more strongly than it does perhaps uh, some other native speakers in, in the room who are from the south. Um, but I'm very, very happy that it's as established as it is because um, I find uh, I, I have to declare total incompetence. I cannot teach Dark L to anybody who hasn't got it already. Um, if, if, any, if any members of the panel can tell me how to, how to teach, uh, reliably and effectively, all to people who, who find it very difficult to make one, um, then please, please tell me how to do it. I've tried and tried and tried, and since it, now I now decided this year just to stop bothering. And uh, if people want to say build, that's so much, everybody can learn to say build. And, um, and uh, if Tony Blair does it, and etc., 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 why not? So, people who've got the dark, and I say, fine, keep it. But and then people, people who find it very difficult to make one just use a vocalized L. Probably if it's performed correctly, it won't be very noticeable. But people want to glory in uh, various types of uh, dark L and vocalized L. They can go to a town where I used to live, uh, Bristol. It even has L at the end of the name. And in Bristol, the one uh, where you have uh, schwa in final schwa in, in, in uh, standard in uh, English and in RP, RP, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they often have a very close back vowel, uh, which sounds to non-Bristolian ears like uh, an L. So you can go and pick Daniels in Australia quite easily, and you can talk uh, about uh, the, the old Dutch queen as Queen Wilhelmina. Somebody asked about the epenthetic T's. They said, why can words like prince and concert have an epenthetic T, but not concept and conception. <laughs> well, my view of this is to do with the division into syllables. You could have the epithetic plosive only if the N and the S are in the same syllable. So we don't get it in inside when they're in separate syllables, but we do get it in dance, becoming a dance. I say that to someone who doesn't use this empathetic T myself at all, and you don't have to either. But if you want to, that's the position where people who do it, do it. Uh, other people who have other views about celebrification will have to give you their own views as to how to formalize this. What about the word else? Somebody said, can you have empathetic T's with Some people L can, yeah, and between L and else. else. Same thing happens in German, of course, and exactly the same as other Germans can say als instead of als. Uh, just like Zaltz, but others, others can't. Some English people say else, for else. I think it's trivial beyond words, really. It never went to me at all. I've never had anybody doing the wrong one, really. Um, forget it. Okay. Right. Um, the role of transcription in teaching pronunciation. How important is it? Somebody said they were very impressed by the amount of transcription that has been done on this some course. Um, and, you know, do the panel think that it is indeed an aid to acquiring good pronunciation. Well, I'd like to quote John Wells on this. <laughs> he says, if you, can't, if you can't write it in transcription accurately, how do you possibly expect to say it properly? And that's, the, that's your answer. And that was partly based on my own experience learning French, where I did French at school in the normal way that we all do in Britain, but then I came and did a course of French phonetics here, where we had to transcribe French, and it was a revelation to me. I realized I hadn't even been aiming at the right target for certain words. Yes, I had just the same experience when I read a book on French phonetics, and I thought I'd get half the words wrong. But they are, you've got to learn it, haven't you? Well, Henry uh, Sweet's uh, called phonetics the indispensable foundation of linguistics, and I would say that transcription is the indispensable foundation 
of uh, phonetics, or at least the type of phonetics which is used in uh, language teaching. Okay, a couple of questions directed at both. <laughs> um, why are fortis and leanis often preferred to unvoiced and voiced? Somebody noticed that in your mm. lectures you often use those terms. Well, I don't see why this should be directed at me. But if what I would say is that uh, the unfortunate thing about voiced and voiceless is people then think that, shall we say, um, a, a consonant like T is always voiceless, when in fact one can have a voice T in an American English T voicing we all know. Uh, why should one think that uh, a consonant like D, which is potentially voiced, which it is not invariably voiced. If I say something like bad, I don't have any voice in that final D, but it's certainly a D. The point is that fortis uh, and leanest are better terms in that they cover more of the distinguishing features of these two types of consonant. However, if you don't want to depress your um, uh, uh, children or, or younger pupils, shall we say, with using these terms, you can quite easily use strong for uh, fortis and uh, you can replace leanness by uh, weak and get the, the same uh, effect. All you could do is I go back to the 1880s with Henry Sweet called Sharp, uh, well, Sharp for fortis, if you like, and I use soft for the other one. People use various things. The trouble with fortis and leanness and Voice and voice, and they both aren't adequate. Fortis only has been strong and weak, and uh, voice and voiceless don't parallel. You can have things that are one and not the other at the same time. So uh, they're both of them a bad term. Why not have a simple cover all term? As I say, sharp's very good for them, and it doesn't mean either of, of what those two mean that are separate. But it has a distinct disadvantage, yeah. and that is it's not used by other people except well, by you and Henry Smith. Yeah, he was highlighted like pre 40, so as a quick way of There's another question with Bev's name on it. Yes. <laughs> it was, you recommended that we say all the time instead of all the time. Um, but there's now going to be a question here what sort of error is that? Well, I've thought about this because you, um, you attacked me with this one at, uh, in the coffee break. And I think that I would say that this is well, kind of, uh, uh, a, a, well, a clear to neutral L, uh, shall we say. Certainly not a vocalizer. You can't, at least not in my type of English, you can't say all the time. Uh, maybe you can in London uh, English, possibly you can, but not in, not in the type of English which we're, um, which we're using here as uh, our, our And do you make it dental or alveolar? That's the other interesting question. I, I think I can say it, but you can judge. If I say all the time, and that's purely out of the over there, all the time, but I think you can say all the time and get away with it. You can say in the corner and get away with it. And this, I think, cuts out a potential minefield uh, of these uh, dental fricatives. So, down with dental fricatives. Question for historical um, if a simulation exists to ease articulation, where does dissimulation fit in? Yeah, I, that's, I mean, I'm not that I'm a historical linguist, as Jeff just said, I'm a hysterical linguist. <laughs> um, and I, it's, I think that the, these processes, it is obviously a simulation, but you can argue that it makes articulation easier, and therefore dissimulation makes articulations more difficult. So why does it happen? Well, I, th I think that the, you get less dissimulation from the simulations, it's true. But if you, if you do measure it um, historically, obviously dissimulations do happen. Um, I don't think anybody, unless somebody, somebody else can enlighten me, anybody knows exactly why. You can't give a logical answer to why dissimulations happen. The fact is that they do happen. Um, and a sort of the form of dissimulation, I suppose, is what you were talking about before with epimethetic T. That's, that's, that's adding a little bit of articulatory um, work to, to what you've got to do to, to, to get your information across. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a terrible answer, but I think it just, it just happens. And then it goes away again, like a few years later. Anybody want to say anything more? I think we look at the actual cases we get in their various languages, by far the most typical is dissimulation of R and L. 
and as our Japanese learners will tell us, it can be tricky to distinguish between them. It's all in the mind. It's a matter of organizing your articulatory movements. And so historically, when you have an R and L close to one another, or two R's or two L's, there is a tendency to do something with one of them. So either you get Latin marmor, giving English marble, where the second R turns into an L, because then they're different from one another, or you get the American kind of business where, in a word like what ought to be a surprise, they remove the first R, despite being wrote, you can say surprise, just as we do, or governor, they change it to governor. Ain't that elision rather than dissimulation? Well, uh, it depends what we mean. We're making the segments less similar to one another by, or right if I did something, but uh, we can take that argument on later. That's exactly what it is. Okay, we've got about five minutes for a few questions concerning intonation. So I'll ask Jeff this one. <laughs> um, somebody said we've learnt an awful lot of patterns on this course, but which would you say are the really safe tunes to teach <laughs> <laughs> I should just, just, I think I should just ask all my students to answer that question. Which of the two nuclear tones you should learn? And? Thank you. There we go. Four rounds and four. four. <laughs> you should have. Yes, absolutely. I think, you know, I think we wouldn't be doing our job correctly if we were letting people go away from this course without knowing that they should be able to put ooh, mm, ooh, mm, onto any given um, phrase of English, like the four eyes, and uh, ooh, mm, onto any given phrase of English. I tell them they can do it up in my school. So well, four eyes and four eyes. I think you should, you should be able to use the rice format as often as you go over a speed bump when you're in a car. I think every so often we'll go over a speed bump. We'll go over a speed bump. Mm, you know, really? Really, yes, we do. But, uh, not, not all the time, because if we did it all the time, we'd get hysterical. Rather strange. <laughs> Rather strange. Doesn't it? Rather strange. That is, be careful to make sure that you use a rise, that's a low rising tone, whenever you contradict somebody. Because if you don't contradict them, if you contradict them and use a falling tone, you'll end your friendship forever. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> Okay. Uh, connected with this, how teachable or how learnable is international meaning? <coughs> so, rather searching question here. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, any, anybody who, who attended my lecture yesterday will see that uh, there's quite a few researchers who don't think that you can teach it or learn it at all. Um, thank you very much to those people. Um, I, I don't know, easy, hard, it depends on the learner, um, it may well depend on the teacher, um, I'm just having a good understanding of, of, um, of what's key, what's important. Um, again, it's a bit of a how long is a piece of string question, I think. Um, there are certain things that you can teach and I feel that you should teach, and I agree with Jeff on those two tones, I think they're possibly the most, the, the two most important. Yes, a nucleus placement and, uh, and tonality, chunking. So those things um, I feel are important and you can, you can convey a lot of meaning by having your nucleus in the right place and making sure that your groups are, um, are indicated in a way which connects with the grammar and the meaning and also um, if you teach those two tones, I think in particular, um, then uh, you, can, you can get a long way with intonation in the classroom. Somebody else said, don't the lectures on intonation and pragmatics give this area too much weight? Isn't it about the students' heads? Uh, well, again, I think it depends on the student. It depends on the learner. Um, depends on what stage they're at, whether they're ready for that kind of thing. Depends on the teacher. Depends on the teacher, yes. Um, I mean, if everybody had Tim teaching this, I'm sure you'll agree. Everyone would know what they were doing. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's, it's, again, it's a difficult question to answer. Yeah. But, uh, well, I mean, John, did you just mention tonicity? The importance of tonicity? Yeah. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yes, yes, yes. 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 placement is, is extremely important, and you can't uh, get that right in English without pragmatics. You need to know about context yeah. in order context, to understand yeah. the de-accenting of given information. 
and uh, re-accenting are things for emphasis and contrast. But de-accenting given information uh, is, is as fundamental uh, an aspect of, of English pronunciation as just about anything else segmental or super segmental. So, so in terms of whether or not if intonation and pragmatics is whether we should treat that as over the heads of the students in this course, no, not at all. You, should, you must know how to de-accent given information. Yeah. Well, not, not the students on this course, but um, mm -hmm. it, it might be something which is difficult for learners at particular levels to cross. But yes. you, you, have to, you have to be able to have learners understand what the, what the pragmatic issues were to be able to choose where the nucleus goes. So that's something that, um, that learners will need to have um, a fundamental understanding of. Um, how far you go into that is, is another question. Mark's international <coughs> transfer from L1 to L2, somebody said, what is likely to happen with the international transfer from L1 to L2? What patterns get transferred? I really don't. Depends enormously on the first language we're talking about. Speakers of Germanic languages have very little difficulty with English intonation because they have a very similar pattern. But uh, French people, for example, have enormous problems with nucleus placement. So, you can't really, I think, give a, a general answer to that question. What is true, though, is what Jeff said, that the placement of the nucleus, the tonicity, is very, very important in communication and in understanding and being understood. <clears throat> okay. Well, somebody had a comment to make. They said, Tim's example about my wife, who is, what was it, who is in New York, <laughs> is being me. My wife who lives in Paris is a teacher. My wife who lives in Paris, they said, they said that's not intonation, that's bigger. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Somebody else um, made a little comment too. They said um, perhaps the groups ought to be more homogenous um, and there should be an entrance test to ensure this greater homogeneity. Any thoughts on that? Or are we happy with our... It's going back to really... the, the type of clause that's called defining clauses and non-defining clauses. But the point about those is that one of those two types is never used in, sp in ordinary spoken English. Right. The one that gets between commas in a piece of written English. Now this last comment is a very uh, general one on the makeup of groups. I hope this is a matter for the director of the course, to be honest. There are severe practical problems in giving people tests beforehand. Uh, we do do this, did do this, when we have a separate IPA strand, but it's a great administrative burden, and uh, it means that people can't join in the last minute, for example. Really, I think it's impractical. Over many years, we've sort of refined the way we do this, and. I think we've achieved more or less the best balance that is actually practical. Okay, so I think we might wind up there. I'd like to thank all of you very much for sending in your questions. And let's thank the members of the panel individually for their contribution. They worked very hard. We have Gatwin to Lewis. <laughs>
once again. And uh, you're going to need your hands. There's a lot more applauding to come in a minute. <coughs> I expect the time's gone by very quickly for you. <coughs> it certainly has for me. There was flashes past. I think SCEP is a very special time. It's a time of new knowledge, new friendships probably, new inspirations. And we all hope you're going to go home inspired to go on studying English phonetics. That's the important thing, to go on studying. And we hope that many of you will come back to UCL on another occasion and study further with us. In fact, we've already started planning very seriously for next year. You've seen that next year's dates are the 1st of August to the 13th of August. You have a chance to be the very first person to enroll. <laughs> Before I come to the, the thank yous and congratulations, I just want to tell you two simple practical things. <clears throat> the party, which begins in about half an hour's time, is at Chandler House. You've been to Chandler House before if you were at the tea party on the first day. You'll find that there are groups of people walking over there together, so don't get lost. Remember to cross the road cross Gower Street very safely. <laughs> I haven't had to go to the hospital yet this year. Uh, cross the road very safely and you'll make your way to Chandler House. Um, in order to get into Chandler House, your card will probably do the trick. It should open the electronic gates for you. But when you leave the party, or indeed after you're inside the gate, you will have used your card for the last time. You don't need the card after today. And we will present, we, we, we will uh, make available a box in which you can uh, put your cards to be returned, please. It's very important that you return the card, especially if you think you may come back on a future occasion, because your card will expire and if it hasn't been returned, then it will have to be paid for. So you return the card, and then next time you will get another one. I particularly want to say that to the staff, the SCEP staff, who are very bad about walking off with the cards in their pockets and creating us great difficulties, great difficulties next year. So, when you leave the party, if, if it's the last time you'll be needing it, put the card in the box. I should say that returning the card does not terminate your UCL ID and password. You can still access the online resources without the card, and the online course will remain available until midnight on Thursday the 30th of September, at which point it will be switched off until next year. So you have five or six weeks to go on using those resources. More will be uploaded. The slides and so on that I haven't had a chance to put on will appear over the next couple of days. And once you're home, you'll be able to revise. Well, now we do come to the thank yous. And this is where you need to get your hands ready, because I'm going to mention people in turn. The first person I always want to mention and she's sitting right at the back up there, is a very important person in the summer course you've all dealt with right from the moment you first applied. Please give a big round of applause for Molly Benny. on the list coming up now who've done two or more jobs so they're going to get two or more lots of applause. Uh, Kate is here isn't she? Where is Kate? Right, Kate has been a tutor but for weeks before the course she was my assistant in sorting out the terrible business of IDs and passwords and she deserves please a very big round of applause. <laughs> again is uh, Tim, but I want to thank Tim Wharton, my deputy director, for everything he did. In my <laughs> uh, 
And most of the other names are tutors, but there were indeed a few lecturers who were not tutors, and uh, John Wells is one who uh, came and did ear training and lectures this year, though not classes, so a special uh, round of applause for John. to applaud your own tutor, and indeed any other tutors you happen to like. Um, after, after this gathering, there'll be no more speeches today. <coughs> so take your opportunity now at the party. There's too much noise for anyone to be heard. So no more speeches. This is the last chance. So we're taking the groups one at a time. Let's hear first of all Bev Collins. Yesterday, I'm teaching pronunciation. There's someone at the table here. Oh. 